It was so many years ago, over 30 years, that God laid his hand on me. And I'm so grateful for what he's going to do. Sunday school is dismissed at this time. Praise God. Praise the Lord. If you look around and you don't see somebody here this morning, pray for them. You don't know why they're not here, but just give them a, give them a shout. Give them, you know, give them a call. Let them know. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I was um, at the conference, and I got a phone call from Brother James Moffat, and he said, um, hey, brother, how's it going? And we started talking, and I said, where are you? He said, I'm down the Cape. I'm in your area. And I said, well, what are you doing Sunday? He says, well, my wife's preaching at her father's church. And I said, well, are you preaching? He said, no. I said, well, come preach. Come be with us, you know. And it's so fitting because this is our last service in this building, and uh, I believe that God has a wonderful word for us today. Amen? I don't believe in just having speakers come just for the sake of having them come. I believe that when they come, it's because God has something for us to, to learn and to apply to our lives. Amen? So I want to give him as much time as he needs and welcome him. You remember him last year? He came and did uh, John in Revelation. He, he played that part in the, in the, in the play. And, uh, yeah, you really enjoyed that, didn't you? And uh, he played uh, John on the stage, did a wonderful job in our church. So would you please welcome Brother James Moffat to the platform this morning. Well, praise the Lord. Oh, come on, you can do better, better than that. For a second there, I thought you were one of the denominational churches down the street. Uh, you know, I, I want to thank your pastor and, and his lovely wife for, for letting me come. I, I uh, actually wasn't expecting to be here this year. I, you know, and I, I love hearing my wife preach, so it was really difficult for me to leave her, except that I was able to leave her with the kids. So I'm sorry you don't get that. I know Ed, the reason everybody invites me to speak or whatever is because they want to see the wife and kids, but I, you got me today, okay? Um, but I, I really love being here, and you know, I, I, it, it's been, I don't know how many years, but it's been a lot of years that we've been coming here, and, and we love this place, but I just went over and looked at the, at the new place that you're going into, and I, I already love that place, so I, you know, I think you're going to have a great time over there, amen? Um, I, I've got a, I want to share a few things with you before the message today, because I very seldom, I, 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 I go to conventions, and they expect me to give a missions report, and I, I don't like giving missions reports. I just, it sounds like you're bloviating, okay? So, well, we did this, and we did that, and, we, and I, I don't like doing that. I'd rather just talk about the Word of God, and, and let's see what God wants to do. But uh, at the same time, um, there's been some very strange things happening uh, in my world in China, as well as in Colorado, and, and there, as you know, there's been some really strange things happening in the world as a whole, and I believe with all of my heart that we're living in a time that all of the prophets look forward to. You know, they look forward to the birth of Jesus, they look forward to the death and resurrection of Jesus, but they also look forward to the return of Jesus. We are living in that time. We are going to see the fulfillment of all things. There is nothing greater than that, folks. Nothing greater than that. And the world is getting darker. I find it strange that we have so many churches that the churches are Every corner, sometimes in some buildings, a few, you know. Um, and there's so many churches, so many places of worship, and yet with all the churches, with all the places of worship, with all the people who call themselves Christian, the world still is getting darker. It doesn't seem to make sense. And, and hopefully today's message will bring a little sense to that, and hopefully we can bring light into our portion of the world. Can you say amen? But I, I had to go back to China again in the last few days of August and the first nine days of September. 
Uh, I came, I went there August 27th and came back September 9th. And um, yeah, normally I've been going back two to three times a year. As I, I'm sure you know that we're pastoring in Colorado Springs right now. And uh, normally I've been going two or three times a year since we came back to pastor. And, and uh, we've seen countless souls come to the Lord. I mean, literally in the past three years, I have baptized 1,500 people. This old man, I believe in the Lord giving strength, but folks, when you're out in the sea and the waves are slamming into your back and you're over 60 and you're trying to put these people down in the water and the waves push, I'm tired. <laughs> but we have seen so many things happen and recently God has been changing some things in China I've been working with the underground church for all these years, and I've been incognito. Nobody knew. The government did not know what I was doing, other than they thought I was there teaching school. Now, they may have known some things, but for the most part, I was hidden. Uh, and then uh, the church, this one church, this is just one church where I baptized these 1,500 people, a hundred here, a hundred and fifty there, et cetera, et cetera, over the time of the ministry that we would lead people to the Lord and then we would come back the next time and, uh, and baptize them. Um, and the church began to grow so big. And in China, we might, be, we might be able to get away with this many people in a service. We might. But it's better to have 20 or under because... You attract too much attention when you have more than 20 people. I, that might sound weird. So when in China, when they begin to get more than 20 people, they begin to start other churches so that they can branch out and they have cell groups upon cell groups upon cell groups. But this church, as we began to grow more and more people, uh, we stayed together. The people stayed together. And you're talking a church that became so big that it attracted the, t the attention of the Chinese government. Now, there is a legal church in China called the Three Self Patriotic Church. The word patriotic ought to tell you everything that you need to know. Because it's not patriotic to Jesus, it's mainly patriotic to what the government tells it that it can preach. Your pastor knows he was there. I actually had to ask the people that came, what are you going to preach? What, I mean, even with the underground church, I had to ask the people, what are you going to preach? So that I could give them a synopsis ahead of time so they wouldn't have to worry. I mean, it was really, it's really that way there. Well, the, with the legal church, it's even more so because... You don't preach about the Holy Spirit. You don't preach about the power of God. You don't preach about uh, any of the gifts of the Spirit. You don't preach about uh, reaching out in evangelism. You don't give altar calls. You, I mean, you know. And so this church became so big. This was the underground church. It became so big that uh, the attracting the attention of the legal church, the legal church said, you have to join us or you're going to jail. Now, I have been part of this church as well as many other churches for many years, and they said, you're going to have to join us or you go to jail, uh, and disbanded. And uh, they, they hemmed and they hawed and they did everything they could to keep out of it for as long as possible. But finally, they had to join the legal church. And, and when they did, the legal church sent an overseer pastor there. And they allowed the, the elder from Taiwan who had started the church to continue to be uh, part of it. But nevertheless, they sent an overseer pastor who is a government pastor. Now, the government tells you what you're allowed to preach. And they control everything that you do. And yet, the thing is that when, when he came, I should have been out of the picture. There should have been no me at all because this causes troubles. And I'm not talking about the beard, folks. This causes troubles in China. You cannot be uh, a foreigner in a group of Chinese people, and especially in a large group of Chinese people, teaching, preaching, etc., 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 and not attract attention. And the government never thinks that, gee, maybe you're just preaching about Jesus. They think you're preaching sedition against the government. They have no concept. You know, uh, and so uh, the legal church pastor, by right, should have stopped me from doing any of the things that I've been doing all these years. Instead, God gave me favor 
in his eyes to the point where he opened his arms, just treated me just like I was one of him. He even says he wishes that I could come back to, pa uh, to China and be a pastor in a legal church in China. Now, that's that never been done. So he asked me last year, he said, can you come to my hometown when you come back in March? And I said, yes, I'll come. Well, when I got ready to go back in March, I already had so many things scheduled, I was not able to go to his hometown. And so I, I, I was there for a month, but there was no way to arrange it. And when I told him, his face fell. In China, you don't want to let somebody's face fall. You'll have, you'll have an enemy for life. And I, I, I told him, I said, oh, Pastor Young, I said, I'm so sorry. It, did, it didn't work out. I said, sometimes that happens. I said, but I promise you, I will come here in August and do nothing else except go with you to your hometown. Well, that made him feel a little bit better. And so we went to his hometown and I preached in the legal churches. Now, his hometown is a small village of about a million people. Think about that. <laughs> It's a small village of about a million people, and I preached in several of the, under, uh, the legal churches there. And I did not preach in the underground church because that would create friction. And so now I'm caught between the legal church and the underground church, and I'm, I'm still not sure that they're not using me to find out where my underground churches are. And so <laughs> we'll see how that works out over the years. But Pastor Young was so... He was so supportive of everything that I've done there. After we got done with the legal church, uh, preaching in the legal churches, he told me, he says, Pastor Ma, he says, I have 22 churches that I'm in charge of. I want you to come back here and have a pastor's conference for those churches. This is not done by a foreigner, and especially by an American it's not done in China. And so I need you to keep that in prayer sometime next year. I don't know when. Sometime next year, I'm probably going to be going back uh, for that. And it needs a lot of prayer. But on this trip, normally I, I have a translator. Now, I speak Chinese, and I speak it okay. I don't really need a translator in everyday conversation or anything like that. But when it comes to the Word of God, I'm so afraid that I'm going to say something not quite clearly enough that I usually use a translator. Those of you that saw the play last year with John, I do that in Chinese as well as English. So, I mean, I can, I, I'm not bad with the Chinese, but when I'm preaching, I use a translator because I want to make sure everything comes out perfectly. And if the translator translates wrong, it's okay. I'll correct them in Chinese. The people get a kick out of it. They love it. Um, to give you an example, one time I was preaching in China, and I said that the presence of the Lord, which is what we're going to talk about today, the presence of the Lord. I said, the presence of the Lord is here. And the, tr the translator translated, the pastor has brought us presents from the Lord. <laughs> now, folks, there's no way I could bring that many presents, to, you know, and... <laughs> And I quickly said, no, no, that is not what I said. So it's very difficult when, when somebody's translating for you in China. Quite often, they don't uh, hear exactly right. But that's okay. When we speak English, we don't always hear each other exactly right either, do we? Speaking of which, when you do get down, when you do get discouraged, when you do feel anger or disappointment or whatever, the Lord said he's given you something besides a light and besides a bell. He's given you a voice. Use it. Sing. And you'll see that all of that's going to fly away. No depression. No sorrow. No. Just sing. And you'll feel the joy bells ringing in your heart. Okay? But in either case... Here, here we are, I'm in China again, and I'm, I'm looking for my normal translators, and I usually have uh, young men to translate for me whose, their English is very good, and, and they're used to me, and so they, when I move, they move. When I get loud, they get loud. When I get soft, they get soft. And I normally, I've gotten so used to them translating for me that I just assumed that they would always be there. Well, I went this time, and they said, well, we're going into this village, and your translators cannot come with us because they're all working. 
I thought, what am I going to do now? They said, well, you can speak Chinese. I said, no, 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 I'm not going to preach in Chinese. You've got to get me a translator. And they said, well, there's this girl. And I said, but a girl can't translate for me. And, you know, she's, she's not used to me. And, and she's 19 years old. I'm 62. She's 19. Boy, that's going to look real good up there, her translating for me. Well, actually, she did a very good job of translating. And the Bible says that when you... When you abide in him, that you shall bear fruit, and that fruit shall remain. She did an excellent job of translating. I was so surprised. I mean, I just like the guys that always translate for me, I'd raise my voice, she'd raise her voice. I'd, I'd, whatever it might be, she was right there with me. At the end of all the services that we did, she came to me and she said, Pastor Ma, she says, I have to tell you something. She says, you don't know this, you don't remember me. I said, no. She said, we've met before. I said, we have? She said, yes. When I was 13 years old, I came to one of your baptism services. And you gave an altar call, and I gave my heart to Jesus. Your fruit shall remain. And so I, I thought it so great that God would take uh, something that happened seven years ago, and just at the time I needed somebody to translate he would bring that person that had given their heart to the Lord to be there to translate for me. And I, I just thought that was so wonderful that God would do that. Please keep the ministry in China in your prayers. Um, we're in Colorado, but we're trying to do both. And uh, <laughs> it's a little hectic, but it's working. Plus, we're still traveling around the country doing John. We just did John in Wareham. And we're going to be going to North Carolina this week, and we're going to be doing John in North Carolina before we head back to, uh, to Colorado. And we're go it's going to be in a Chinese church. So keep that in your prayers as well. Um, in either case, China, you know, when God calls you into something, he doesn't just take you out of it. There's still, that will always be part of you. It's never going to just totally be gone. We're busy in, in Colorado Springs doing everything we can for the, for the local church there, but, but China is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, so please keep it in prayer. Our world is a mess. How many can say amen? I, I mean, it's there's no doubt when you, if you read the newspaper, you're better off if you don't read the newspapers, but if you read the newspapers, if you see the news, there is no doubting that the scriptures are coming alive in front of your eyes. The fact that, the fact that people are doing such wicked things that they're doing now, who would have thought in our day and age that the barbarism of thousands of years ago would suddenly be there again where people would be losing their heads, where people would be doing such terrible things in the name of a God. Nobody would. I, I would never have thought this uh, some years back. When God first sent me to China, I thought for sure it was because the 200 million man army was going to march out of China and uh, that I, would, I would win some, people, some Chinese people to the Lord before that happened. Now, after 911, most people agree that that 200 million man army is not China or Russia, although they may be involved in it. But that 200 million man army is Ishmael. It's coming from the Middle East. It's, it's people rising up in the name of their God to destroy. That will destroy one third of the people on earth. One third of the people on earth. That's what the word says. I, I find it so Difficult to believe that in our day and age that this could happen, that after World War II, after World War I, that we could again be falling into the same kind of thing where we just go along with what's happening and allow it to happen. And yet, that's what's going on in the world. What caused this to happen? I believe with all of my heart 
that the reason that this has happened is because the church, who is supposed to be a bright and shining light sitting on a hill, that the church as a whole has lost its light. The light is still there, but it has become so dim that it, is very, it has very little effect on the darkness. It has, it has very little effect on those that are lost and, and in darkness. It's like, uh, it's like people say, well, you don't understand, Pastor. I have this and I have that. I, don't, I have this and I have that. I've got to do this. And I have so many things to do. And yes, we do. But nothing, literally nothing should come before God. Nothing should come before Him in our thinking. Nothing should come before Him in our lives. Nothing should come before Him in our family. Nothing should come before Him in our jobs. Nothing should come before Him in our daily walk. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 and 51, if you could look there, please. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 and 51. When you're there, say, oh, me. Ouch. Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51. It says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Father God, we thank you. We, we thank you for your word, and, and we ask, Lord, even as we, as we get into your word today, Lord, that it be not, Lord, words that come from my lips or from my thinking or from my heart, but, Lord, that it be words that come from your heart. Lord, send your angels with a coal to touch my lips, Lord. Lord, that even as I speak, Lord, uh, I might speak forth your word in purity. I might speak forth your word uh, as, as you would have it to be spoken, Lord, that it will touch our our hearts, Lord, that our lives will be changed, that our minds will be cleansed, Lord, that our lives will more and more exemplify you, Lord, that we will be able to enter into your presence in a great and mighty way, and we thank you for it, in Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. in the wilderness, you could say the children of Israel were, were pretty much called the people of the presence because unlike all other people that had gods that they worshipped, all of those other people, when they went somewhere, they had to carry their figurine of their god with them. They had to take the thing that they made with their own hands with them so that they could say, my god is with me. And that god never exhibited any kind of power that God had no way to help them or hurt them, that God had no power at all because it was something that they had created with their own hands. But here come the Israelites into the midst of these people. They do not carry their God with them. Their God manifests himself in their presence by a pillar of cloud, by a pillar of fire in the wilderness where all can see, not just the Israelites, but all the surrounding countryside can see that these people have something real. You would think... You would think that these people would say, or the, the non-Israelites, that they would say, hey, something's going on over there. I want to find out about it. I want to see it. I want to know what's going on. I want to be part of it. But they didn't. The fact is, they fought. They they fought against the Israelites. They fought against the very presence of God that they could see. They did not want this in their midst. Even though they knew that they had nothing that could compare to this, they still fought against it. Now, if we look at the scripture that we just read, it's talking about Jesus when he's on the cross. And it says that the veil of the temple was torn in top from, the, uh, from the top to the bottom and the earthquake and the rocks were split. 
in the wilderness when the, when the high priest uh, made sacrifice on the day of atonement one day a year, only he, he and only he, could enter into the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies was the very presence of God. And only the high priest could enter in there. When he went in there, he would be at the mercy seat. And people that would be in the holy place, not in the holy of holies, but in the outer, in the inner court, in the holy place, they could hear the voice of God. The priest would not speak, but the voice of God would be speaking to him. And he would come out and he would say, What thus saith the Lord? When the prophets spoke and they said and the word of the lord came to me saying i believe with all of my heart that somehow in the spirit they entered into that holy of holies somehow in the spirit they went into that holiest of places and they stood before jesus christ and the word jesus christ the word spoke out of them that's that's the way i see those scriptures as saying that it wasn't just a man that's why that's why the scriptures say these men spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit of god they wrote as they were moved by the spirit of god it was more than just a man speaking and I would believe that they were standing in the very presence of God. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. In his presence, there's power. In his presence, there's life. In his presence, there's healing. In his presence, there's our everything that we need. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 6 Ephesians 2, 6 says these words. And he has raised us up together. He made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Hebrews 10, 19, it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest uh, by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10, 20 says, By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So when we read that first scripture and it talked about the veil of the temple being rent at the time that Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus rose from the dead, that place that the, that the high priest had only been able to enter before suddenly was open to anyone, to anyone, to anyone who was willing to enter in by the blood of Jesus Christ, walk right into the holiest of places, walk right into the very presence of God, And become somebody completely different. Because you see, it's impossible to enter into the presence of God as a mess. When we enter into the presence of God, it's because something inside of us must have him. We must have him. We're not thinking about all of our troubles. We're not thinking about all of our difficulties. We're not thinking about all of our disappointments. We're not thinking about all of our sorrows. We're not thinking about everything that's happened to us today. We're thinking about him, him, him. We want him. We want his presence. We want to know him. And when Jesus died on the cross and that veil of the temple was rent, the way was made for you, for me, for each of us to enter into his presence. I want you to notice that we just read in Ephesians 2, 6, it doesn't say someday he will cause us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It says he has made us to sit together. Now, in other words, he has made us to sit in heavenly places. It says that now in Hebrews, we can enter in through him into the very presence of God. If that is true, why is it that so few 
people. So few Christians, and I'm talking about Christians who, who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, Christians who have been, uh, been in the church for years and years and years, yet they have never entered into the presence of God. Yes, yes, they've come around the periphery. Yes, they've been touched by God. Yes, they have been uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yes, they, they attend church. Yes, they're part of so many different things, but they've never really entered into the presence of God to where they're just not the same person. You have to understand, folks, when, when Isaiah looked up and, and he saw the Lord, he, he fell down on the ground. He, he could not stand because he realized that what he was, he, he, there's no way to stand before this. In our day and age, well, God's my friend. Well, yes, he is. But he's also holy. His holiness has never changed. He's also God. He's our friend, but he's God. And we have to keep those two things in our mind when we approach him. He loves us. He cares for us. He's our father. He's our friend. But he is God and he is holy. And when we come into his presence, we have to come into his presence knowing that it's his will that must be done. Not ours. His will. So, I, I, I prayed, I said, Lord, there's so many people that have so many difficulties in the churches of today. If I were to ask for a show of hands right now, how many people, how many people right now have financial difficulties in your life? Let me see your hands. Now, be honest, how many, people have, how many people have health problems in your life right now? How many people have uh, uh, just uh, sorrow in your life right now? How many people have other issues in your life right now that you would really like to be free of and you haven't been able to be free of them? So many hands go up. And yet we should be in his presence. And if we're in his presence, all of these other things began to fall away. He said, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. All of these other things should begin to fall away. And I begin to cry out, Lord, how is it possible that we could have so many things happening in our lives? And, and yet we say, we're in your presence. The Chinese, when they're talking in Chinese, every sentence they say, Gan xie zhu, Gan xie zhu. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord. I mean every sentence. The Lord loves you, thank the Lord. I went to work today, thank the Lord. I, I, ate, uh, I ate noodles for breakfast, thank the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm very serious about this. And, and uh, they also, in every conversation, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times will say, Zhu you need Hong Zai. The Lord is with you, or the presence of the Lord is with you. And yet, these kind of things become platitudes, if you will. They, they, become, they become a habit to say, but we don't really experience because we've gotten so used to the way things are, we, we forget that there is something more than what we have already experienced. There is something more in God, no matter how long you've known the Lord, no matter how deep you've gone in the Lord, there must be a higher height and a deeper depth. There must be a broader breadth. There must be something more in him than we've experienced. And yet, for most of us, we don't enter into that place. And yet Ephesians said this should be that we were already made to sit in heavenly places. If we're sitting in heavenly places, we should be in his presence. Well, Luke chapter 6, verse 21. Luke chapter 6, verse 21. Open to this because I think this is a very, it's a very interesting scripture. Many people will read, uh, they'll, they'll quote from Matthew 5, 6. It says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Many people quote that scripture, but very few people quote it from Luke. Luke 6, 21 says, blessed are ye that hunger now. 
Hear what that says. Hungering now. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. It's very important that we understand our God is not a God of yesterday. Our God is not a God of tomorrow. Yes, he's yesterday, today, and tomorrow all together. But he is a God of today. He is here. Wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. He is here. And he's here to touch us. He's here to heal us. He's here to deliver. He's here to set free. He's here to raise his people up into higher heights and deeper depths in him. And we have, we have put God in a box and we haven't allowed him to do it. We haven't allowed him to do it. Oh, we've said that's what we want. But every time we get just a little bit close, we back off. Because something else becomes so much more important. Let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever been starving here, physically starving? Anybody? I have. You don't know what it's like to go hungry sometimes till you've been a missionary, okay? But I have. When you're hungry, when you're really hungry, and I'm not talking about just, you know, a day or two, you know, you, you, you skip a meal or two. No, I'm talking about where you're not not eating because you're fasting. You're not eating because you don't have anything to eat. Now think about that. I'm talking about you would give anything, anything to get just a bite of food. Remember, Esau was so hungry, what did he do? He sold his birthright just for a little bit of pottage. He sold his birthright. Everything that he ever hoped for, dreamed for, every, every ambition he ever had, every inheritance he ever had coming, he sold it for a little bowl of food. That's what you will do when you're starving. Well, many of us have been starving without even realizing it. And, and instead of uh, uh, using that hunger to, to push us into the presence of God, we've gone after other things instead, thinking that we were hungering after material things, thinking that we were hungering after financial things, thinking that we were hungering after the worldly things. And yet the thing that we really need, the thing that we need most of all is Jesus Christ. We need to walk with him, talk with him, live with him. We need to have him walking in us the perfect stature of a man so that people will look at us and say that's what I want the children of Israel walking in the wilderness the presence of God you would think that all the people around would say that's what I want we are supposed to have that presence in our life in a greater way than the children of Israel ever dreamed because that presence is supposed to be within us. We should have that presence in such a way that not only is that presence within us, but that we have turned around and walked into his presence so that the world could say, wow, that's what I want. So that we would be a shining pillar of fire, a pillar of light. The problem is that we are hungry, but we don't know what we're hungry for, and so we're running after the wrong things. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for you shall be filled. Hunger is a very strong desire and a craving to crave ardently, to seek earnestly. How often have we really sought earnestly after the Lord? How often have we really laid down everything else? Oh, yes, we, we pray, God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need the other thing. And, and, when, and when somebody else has a problem, sometimes we'll take a moment to say, God, they need. But mostly it's about me. It's about me. It's about me. And we don't realize that that's not seeking the presence of the Lord. 
that's seeking for things that ultimately will disappear. Seeking the presence of the Lord is saying, you know what? None of these other things matter. What I think I need doesn't matter. Whether or not I'm healed, it doesn't matter. Whether or not I'm delivered, it doesn't matter. Whether or not I, I feel free, it doesn't matter. Whether or not I feel joy, it doesn't matter. Only thing that matters is I want Jesus. 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 I wrote a song a lot of years ago. I'll, I won't be looking for the streets of gold beyond the pearly gates. I won't be looking for my mansion on a hill. I'll start to run and I won't stop until I fall down at his side. When I see Jesus, then I'll be satisfied. And yet we don't need to wait until we're somewhere way off yonder in the sweet by and by. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says, right now I can be sitting in heavenly peace. Places with Christ Jesus. Right now I can look into his face. Right now I can hear his voice. Right now I can be in his presence. But it takes being hungry. It takes wanting it takes wanting more than the world. The normal, everyday things that it takes to make it through this world. It takes wanting to be in His presence. Blessed are they that hunger now. Now, there's only a couple of categories of people that don't hunger in the natural. One, dead people. They're not hungry. You put a plate of spaghetti right in front of them, and you know what's going to happen? It'll rot. They won't eat it. The Chinese now, and, and, and a lot of the Oriental countries, they have these God figurines that they have on their walls, and they take chickens, and they take uh, apples, and they take fruit, and different things, and they put them on there along with incense until they pretty much rot out. And they remove it and put new ones up there. Their gods do not eat. Them. You understand what I'm saying? The things of this world will rot out. A dead person is a dead person. Whether that dead person is in the natural, whether that dead person is in the spiritual, a dead person is a dead person and does not hunger. Did you know that it's possible that there are people that are Christians that are really dead inside? Because they haven't nurtured the Spirit of God within themselves. They haven't sought after Him. They haven't cried out to Him. They haven't hungered for Him. And little by little by little, they're, if they're not dead, they're very, very, very close to it. Maybe you know a, a person. Now, don't look at that person next to you. <laughs> There's another category of people that are not necessarily able to eat or not hungry that's somebody that's sick how many of you have ever gotten so sick you couldn't even look at food pregnant women could tell you about that <laughs> uh, have you gotten so sick that oh, get it away from me ah! sick people quite often aren't hungry also people who have a, an overwhelming, I, I have a friend of mine that's very, very large. I mean, he's, he's very large, uh, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. In fact, at one time, he was 700 and some odd pounds. And it wasn't from being hungry. He ate very little. He had physical problems, and, and he really wasn't hungry most of the time. 700 and some odd pounds is a lot of pounds. You understand what I'm saying? He could not get through the door of his house. When they came to get him, my good friend, Roy Dean, when they came to get him, they actually had to cut the door to get him out. Now, he's almost as thin as I am. No, I'm not cultivating to look like Santa Claus, folks. I'm really not. 
I can't go, Pastor. I can't go into Walmart at this time of year unless I shave my beard. Especially not wearing red. But Roy Dean, as big as he was, he wasn't really hungry. At least not as hungry as I was most of the time. A spiritually fat person that has ate and ate and ate and ate on the word of God and not given out, not given out, not given out. They also are not hungry. And then they want to wonder, why is nothing happening in my life? Why is there no power in my life? Why is there no joy in my life? Why is there no deliverance in my life? Why is there no healing in my life? Why am I still the same way now that I was 10, 20, 30 years ago? It's because they allowed the word to go in and in and in and never let it go out. And the people aren't hungry. If we can say that we want God, then we must understand that God has made promises to those that are hungry. One of those promises is found in Psalms chapter 107, verses 35 and 36. Psalms 107, 35, 36 says these words. He turns the wilderness into a standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And there he makes the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation. He turns the wilderness into still waters. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's what that, that's what that means, the standing water. And dry ground into water springs. And there, there, where the water is always there, he leads us to dwell in the midst of the living water. In that place, there is revival. When we're in that place where we're hungry for him, where we want him, where there's nothing else that we want more than him, we will find revival in our lives and in the lives of everyone around us. In that place, there's life. There's victory. There's, there's refreshing. There's fulfillment. In that place, there is everything we could ever hope for. In that place, beside the still water, where the rivers of living water flow. Now that seems a contradiction beside the still waters where the rivers of living water flow, and yet nevertheless, that's the place that he will give us to dwell in. It's also true that the hungry will see his power and his glory. Psalms chapter 63, verses 1 through 2, says, uh, When G David was in the wilderness of Judah, O God, thou, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. hungers for you. It thirsts for you. I want you. He was being chased at that time by the soldiers of Saul. He was being constantly harassed and yet in his flight, in his flight in the wilderness, he was crying out constantly, God, I thirst for you. I don't care about these other things. I don't care about the troubles that beset me on every hand. I thirst for you. I hunger for you. I want you. The hungry folks, the hungry will seek him. The hungry will thirst for him. The hungry will have a, a passion uh, for his power and his glory. The hungry will have a fire burning in the innermost depths of their being that they cannot take no for an answer. They want to be in the presence of God. They want to see him in all of his glory. They want to see his power manifested in their lives and in the lives of all around them. Hungry people, hungering for something that is eternal. Hungry people, hungering for the presence and the majesty of God. When we hunger for him in our darkest moments, that's when we see his power. When we don't let all of these things that beset us every day affect us in any way, shape, or form. When we hunger for him and we cast everything.
everything else aside, crying out to him, seeking after him, keeping our eyes focused on him, then that's when we see his power and glory. That's when we enter into his presence. Yeah. I want to read to you, if, if you would, and if you open your Bibles, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Excuse me, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 32. Luke 24, verses 28 through 32. It's talking about the two disciples that Jesus met with on the road to Emmaus. And it says, And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass as he sat with me, to meet with them, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? It says that they constrained him. The word constrained means they restrained him. They persuaded him. They took a hold of him and they didn't let go. He, he, he made as though he was going to go on. And if they would have let him go on, he probably would have walked right away. But they took a hold of him and said, no, 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 you've got to come with us. You've got to come. We want to hear more. We need to hear more. We have to hear more. Come with us. We don't know who you are, but we need you to be with us. They were hungry. And then, when he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, and suddenly their eyes were open and they realized that they were in the very presence of him that they were mourning, that they were in his presence, that he was not a dead, but he was alive, that he was not uh, in the grave, but he had risen. And their hearts uh, began to cry out. We should have known. We felt our hearts burning within us. We should have known all along that we were in his presence. That's what we need to experience as Christians. That's what we need to experience as people of the Lord, to come into his presence, to go beyond this, this normal everyday way of doing things. I love your worship here. I, I love the fact that people here are, are wanting and, and, and seeking to come into the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Folks, did you know that the people that are worshiping aren't putting on a performance. It's not about a performance. It's, a, it's about a, a coming into the presence of the Lord. And as they come into the presence of the Lord, they draw us, if we will allow them to, they draw us also into his presence uh, that when we worship him, it is with, a, it is with an, a depth to our being that goes beyond anything that can even be explained when we begin to worship him in that kind of Worship. His presence in our midst is so great that it's like a cloud. A, a thick pea fog, I guess is the word, a soup. Like a, it's just so great that we would not be able to stand up under it. In Chronicles, when the priests entered the temple, as they were uh, the praising and worshiping God, they fell down because the glory cloud of God was so great they could not stand up. The presence of God was so great. The presence of God should be so great in our midst that we would not be able to stand. The name of your church, for his glory, for his glory, for his glory, for his presence. The words are interchangeable. For his glory, for his presence. When we understand that it's all about coming into his presence, not just coming to church, but coming into his presence, we're here to worship him. We're here to praise him. When we do that, we are here in his name. He is here in our midst. We cannot leave here the same way that we came in. It's impossible. It's impossible. 
you're going to be closing this place down. How many years have you been in this? 12 years. How many have been here for the whole 12? My goodness. They got stick to it. Stick Stick to it, Is that a word? English teacher. It's close enough, right? Stick to it, Evitus. It's a Massachusetts word, anyway. <laughs> Folks, you're going to be moving into a, a new room. Let that room become like the Holy of Holies. When you walk into that place, walk in there expecting to come into the presence of God. Walk in there expecting to receive something from him. And I'm not talking about bless me, bless. I'm talking about to receive his presence, to, to have him wrap his arms of love around you. Walk into that place praising and worshiping walk into that place singing walk into that place glorifying him when you go through the door let there be a song on your lips and a dance in your step as you move from this place to that place it will be like you've gone from one realm to another from one realm to another if you will hunger, hunger, hunger. How many are hungry? How many want more of God than you have right now? How many commit, you know, I ain't there yet. <laughs> Would everybody stand, please? Pastor said I wasn't allowed to quit till 3 o'clock, but I thought you all might want, not want me to come back if I did that. No, <laughs> he didn't say that. I'd like to have every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment. I don't know everybody here. In fact, I, I, there's quite a few of you I don't know. There's some of you I do know. Some of you that I've known for a long time. But I can't possibly know your heart. You know your heart. The Lord knows your heart. You know where you are. And you know what you need. You know what you need. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you have a need that's greater than you may realize because you've tried to satisfy that need with everything else and nothing 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 satisfies and i'm here to tell you today that only jesus only jesus can truly satisfy to the innermost depths of your being and if you will hunger for him now, even as you've never given your heart to him, if you will say, I hunger now, I want what you're saying, preacher. I want to understand Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want him to come into my heart and my mind. I want him to forgive me and to save me and to change me. If you could say that that's, that's your prayer right now, never ask Jesus into your heart. You want Jesus to change your life right now. Would you raise your hand? For those that have never asked Jesus into your heart, you've never been a Christian. Okay. So are we saying that everybody is already a Christian? If not, I don't want you to go out of this place without receiving yes, Lord. what God has for you today. Because you will have missed a very great, great blessing. Your life will change when Jesus comes into your heart. In your presence. I'll take one more moment. In your presence. 
is there one that will say, I want Jesus to come into my heart. I've never been saved. I want Jesus to come into my heart. In your presence. All right. Now how about for those who say, I've, I've been saved. I'm a Christian. I've given my heart to the Lord, but, but I really don't feel that hunger. I, I I, I, I love God, but I don't really feel that hunger, and I really want that hunger in my life. I want His presence in my life. I want to walk into His presence. I want to live in Him. I want to have a, have move in Him. I want to have my entire being in Him. I want Him to live and move and breathe in me. If that's you, raise your hand. As you raise your hand, I want you to get out of your seat come to the front. Don't wait for somebody else. You raised your hand. You get out of your seat and come to the front. And as you come to the front, don't focus on anything else except Jesus. 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 Focus on Jesus. Come. Come. Come now. Jesus is going to touch you right now as you reach out to him. Let him reach out to you.